here we are once again. It's the video lecture number two. Video lecture number two for PSI 168. And I'll start with a couple of announcements. Namely, let's start with talking about our notes for a moment. Notes and notebook. the book. So we're taking notes for every lecture. This is the lecture for Friday of the first week and so Friday afternoon you'll take the notes from these first two lectures that you have and send them to me by six o'clock and then starting next week you know it'll be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Friday afternoon we send the notes in to me at six o'clock. <coughs> As far as the book goes, the notes are going to turn into a book as we accumulate them uh, the course of the semester. I'll, as I said before, I'll give you a heads up for interesting things to print out. You can seek interesting things to print out to add to your book. And at the end of the semester, you'll have this mass of notes and homework problems and printouts all in a logical order and what we'll add to that to make it even more interesting is we'll when we're all done we'll number the pages one through a hundred or however many you have and make a table of contents and an index so the book will end up with a table of contents and an index And then it'll be very useful for you. The class that this presentation is based on was uh, Natural Science 116, and that was for teaching candidates. So those for students were going to be um, elementary school teachers. And for that reason, in that particular class, we did what we can't do now. This is virtual. We did a lot of work together at the whiteboard. We built little projects and stuff, and included that all in the notebook. But the concept otherwise is going to be very similar because uh, we don't have a lot of time together doing stuff like that. We'll cover more ground actually in terms of material that will be more theoretical. Nonetheless, little projects like taking a protractor and learning how to measure the height of a tree with a protractor and a ruler or little cutouts cardboard cutouts when we're doing geometry can all be part of the mix and if I ask you to do them we can uh, you, know, you can send me a picture of it as part of your your projects so we will we'll recommend we will still recommend some little projects to do and and uh, typically I do many physics demonstrations and I will be able to do those I have a lecture hall a table and out back we have all our demonstrations so I will do demonstrations but you won't be able to actually come have a look at them close up. Some of them you'll be able to repeat at home, uh, and I'll always tell you when you can do that. So yeah, it's gonna be pretty varied, and the end of the semester you'll have your, your book, table of contents, index, and all the skills that you developed on the way. Good, so that's that. And until further notice, it's all YouTube videos and uh, email office hours until further notice. I'll have Canvas up and running at some point. Okay, <clears throat> so in our little outline from last time, I had said we're going to start at the very beginning with some scientific reasoning And there's a nice example I have from the anthropologist Richard Lee. He worked with people out in the Kalahari Desert, hunters. Okay. So I'll put this down as a note for you. You can always look up who Richard Lee is. I'll just write Richard Lee, anthropologist. I had a couple books of his. So We'll title this The Hunt. 
So our hunters are tracking game and they're, they see the footprints on the ground and they're following them. And uh, the footprints go around a tree. So what Richard Lee says is that there's a principle out in the desert, it's hot, and the principle is the traveling herd hates the sun. Traveling herd hates the sun. So there's the quote. And what does that have to do with the herd going around the tree? So I'll draw a tree. There's a tree and then the footprints of the herd go around this side here. I'll draw little arrows. Okay, so the herd is going there on that left side. So the principle now applies. And if they went around that side of the tree, what was good about that side of the tree? Well, what was good about that side of the tree is that there was shade. How about some blue shade? There was shade on this side of the tree, so they went on this side so they could stop in the shade. Well, what that means is, is that the sun was up here when the herd traveled through here. Don't ask me to draw antelope or something, okay? But the sun was over here casting the shadow And what is that? Well, the tree is a sundial. It's actually a clock for them because um, what it means is that when the, they're not seeing the herd there, they're just seeing the footprints. It means that when the herd passed through the side of the tree, the sun was over there. Now, if the sun is somewhere else at that time, then they can estimate that it was either recently or uh, earlier in the day and you know make their decision on whether to keep following and so forth. So the sun, uh, the tree casts a shadow on the ground there, the herd seeks out the shadow and the tree and the sun and this whole thing comprises a sundial. So now I'm going to say that we've generated a way to measure time, the sundial of course, that's an ancient implement for measuring time. And that is as good of a reasoning as you're ever going to encounter, right? That's good reasoning. Now, we're going to take it a next step further. So I'll set this uh, meter stick up. And you have to admit that uh, if I set a meter stick up and the meter stick casts the shadow, it's going to be a more accurate shadow than is cast by this tree. Okay. So let's imagine that we're using, we've, we've progressed from this really basic sundial here to a more accurately constructed sundial. And where's the sun? Maybe I'll just use my disk here. So if the sun is up here, you can see the shadow is going to be cast. I'll use my ruler. Sun's here, the shadow's where that ruler is. Later on in the evening, the sun is up here, and the shadow is correspondingly over there. And you know, it occurs to me that the ruler may not be visible right now. No problem. Sun's over here, shadow's cast in that direction. Point I'm driving at is that there's a time of day when the sun is here, we would call that noon, and the shadow is cast right towards the camera, and it's the shortest shadow of the day. Okay, the shadows in the morning and evening are very long. At noon, they are shorter, and exactly at noon, astronomically speaking, the shadow will be the shortest, and it points directly north. So that's a kind of a fact that we're getting out of this for free here. First of all, we had the discussion of the hunt, and we have the sundial because the sun casts a shadow. So we'll go ahead and fill some words in on that. So now we have a vertical 
meter stick casts a shadow and I'll, I'll in, include two points here. First of all, it's the shortest shadow is at noon. Okay, shortest shadow is cast at noon. And for free, we got here, we can, once we know a little geometry, we'd see why, but it's the shortest shadow is directed to true north, directed north. So now you know how to find north if you don't have a compass, which is magnetic north anyway. True north is the direction of the shadow at exactly at noon, and exactly noon is when the shadow is shortest, okay? So, there we have sundial now, and you can see we're talking about measuring time. Okay. So measuring time is important for everybody, even if you're chasing game out in the savanna. Um, but if you're actually, I will leave that thing standing there. So measurement of time, if you want to make longer plans in life, then you have to actually measure in terms of years. And the day is easy enough, right? Light, dark, light again, and that's one day, okay? So I'm not gonna say any more about the day, but what about the year? How can we measure the year? We need to make longer range, longer term plans. We have to know what a year is. Okay. And in fact, I, I can formulate it in kind of a funny manner. Can we use this meter stick to measure the number of days in a year? That seems paradoxical, right? Meter stick is a length, number of days in a year is a number. But I'll go ahead and write that down anyway. We want to know the number of days in a year. Everybody's answering, well, that's 365. Okay. Number of days in one year using a meter stick. Okay. That's just to be kind of paradoxical, but actually it's going to be a legitimate uh, question here. We want to know the number of days in a year without somebody telling us, so we want to actually measure it ourselves. And the way we're going to use the meter stick, get my fourth point up here, love making lists, right? The way we're going to use the meter stick is use this shadow property. Because not only is the shadow, one of these ends that I can balance this thing. Once more with feel. Okay. Stick. Okay. So what do I have? Two properties. Shortest shadow at noon, directed north. There's one more property here. And that is that the length of the shadow changes as the year progresses through the seasons because in the summer, the sun is more uh, higher over the horizon, closer to directly overhead, and in the winter, the sun is lower. Okay, so everybody's seen that before. In the winter, the sun, and we'll see it through the course of this semester as the, as the uh, season changes, the sun will be lower in the sky, closer to the horizon at noon. And that means we have a correspondingly a corresponding change in the length of the shadow at noon. The noon shadow is always the shortest, but in the winter, that noon shadow is longer than it is in the summer, okay? So that's the point that we're going to make use of. Um, we'll call it the noon shadow, and I'll say that it is shorter in summer, uh, 
become a longer in the winter. Okay. Shorter in the summer, longer in the winter. So now we have an idea. We could measure the length of that shadow every day for a year or two and when the length repeats itself we'll see that we've gone through a certain number of days when the entire year is over the shadow will have gotten shorter longer shorter longer so i'm going to graph that on the board for you what i just mentioned here let's see okay we can erase all of this So we set up our sundial, there it is. It's somewhere in the middle where the sun can hit it every day. I'm still numbering things, so five. Length of what I'm calling the shadow at noon versus number of days. So every day we went out and made our measurement and you've probably seen graphs before. So this is the number of days. We can just start at zero because we're counting some time of the year. So this is L for the length. And we measured it. And it was summer when we started. Got longer in the winter. Shorter in the summer, longer in the winter, shorter in the summer. Okay, it was like that. And so what is a year? You could say a year was from the longest back to the longest. Okay, that was a year, and then it just kept repeating itself for a couple of years. Say you're really patient, okay, you keep doing this, and then you count these out. what do you find? It repeats itself after 365 days. Okay. Well, this is easier said than done. In principle, we have ourselves a method. But in practice, you're going to find that it's not that easy to measure the length of a shadow. In fact, right when you were calling the, you taking these two times here, every day it's almost exactly the same for a few days, and it's hard to do this accurately. And if you want to get accuracy, you're going to have to maybe put a point on the top of the stick. You're going to have to make sure it doesn't tilt at all, right? Everything has to stay exactly the same over the course of the year. So what I'm talking about now is the need for accuracy. Okay. So, six, um, there's the need not only for a great idea, but for accuracy. This is one thing we have in physics, right? It's a very accurate science, but we can talk about things in general, and then someone else may have to actually do the work to make it happen division of labor between ideas and making things happen. So we, there's a definite need for accuracy, and here's what we're going to have to have. First of all, we have to invent numbers. So I'm just going to write, we need numbers and arithmetic. Okay. And the next thing is, we're going to have to, to get this accuracy, we're going to have to invent geometry because accuracy in measurements requires geometry. Okay, how do I know this thing is standing perfectly straight up and down and isn't tilting a little? Okay, so we're going to have to invent geometry. And the third thing we need is units of measurement. So in this case, we need units of length to measure the length of the, set, of the shadow. So units of measurement, I'm keeping that deliberately vague because we'll fill in what type of units we mean. Uh, 
Okay. So now we've started at the idea of you know, using reasoning for hunting. We came through the idea of a sundial, and we want to use that to measure the length of the year because we have big plans. Um, and you know, civilizations have had to do exactly this. So these ideas are, you know, a couple thousand years old for sure. And then, in order to realize these goals, we have to invent mathematics, numbers, arithmetic, geometry, and then units of measurement as well. Okay, so there's a a prologue to everything that we're going to do. And these are, in fact, the inventions of sciences. And it's, we're not at physics yet by any means, but physics is based on geometry, measurements of space and time. So we're well on our way. OK, so let me send that up here. And what we're going to do next is work through some of these topics. I have to lead us through necessary arithmetic, geometry, and different units of measurement. And of course, if you had never studied arithmetic and geometry, we wouldn't be able to do it. But you've seen these things before, and I'm just going to unfold them and put them into context. So that's our next step. First, I'm going to see how we're doing here for time. And time always flies. but. Let's have a look at So there are a couple of interesting things I like to do with arithmetic, for starters. And then I'll start us in on some geometry. All of these little exercises are good for you guys to practice. Everything we're doing, you should just, you know, you're going to write it down. You can repeat it, practice it, make up your own examples. Because in the course of the semester, it's just a constant repetition of those techniques. And you get good at them after a while. OK, so starting with arithmetic, I'm interested in, some, in scientific notation, laws of exponents. So I'm interested in showing you how to deal with large numbers without any kind of intimidation and without the need for a calculator or computer. Okay. So my example is going to be just the division of two wild numbers that I just make up on the spot. Okay. So I want to divide 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, divided by 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. Okay. I don't even know what that means. Those are long numbers. But we want to divide one by the other. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to approximate. We do approximations all the time in physics. When you're able to do approximations, you're able to evaluate what's really important. So the first thing we'll do is just take this as being 5.4 times 10 to the power of something, I don't even know yet, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 5.4 times 10 to the 9th power. And then I'll do the same thing here, 3.2 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So what that is, is 5.4 divided by 3.2 times 10 to the 9 in the numerator here. And there's a 5, and we say 9 minus 5. Okay. If, you had these, if you had these things written out, you would just be canceling that number of, of zeros. Okay. So you'd end up with 9 minus 5. Okay. Now, this is not a threatening number at all. It's more than 1 and less than 2, right? So I'm just going to say approximately, I'm guessing here, 1.7 
times 10 to the 9 minus 5, which is 4. Okay. And of course, that would be 17,400. But the, the scientific notation is the way to just grasp what a number means, what its magnitude really is. Okay. So you can, you can have fun doing this because suppose you did this and if you have it in front of you and if you have a calculator at home, if you can actually do this division with a the calculator, then compare to this number that I just came up with on the spot. Okay. So this is my example and it contains this laws of, uh, of exponents contains the laws of exponents that you can look up if you don't if you've never seen them before um, laws of exponents just some reasonable approximation and before you know it I have this number here okay we need this in physics because we're talking about the universe so here's a meter I'm slightly less than two meters tall Thing we're going to come up with soon is how big is our Earth? We want to compare. Want to compare the Earth? Want to compare the Earth to my own height? One of them's millions. One of them's millions, and one of them's only units. Okay, so we need scientific notation to make those comparisons without drawing numbers. You know, this kind of number. This is what the amateurs do. They write something like this out, and then they have no idea what it means. Okay. So good. That's my discussion of arithmetic with you guys. And if you have, if you want to have some fun, just play around with this sometime. Good. What's next? I think I'll keep the list up here and erase what we have here for arithmetic. So next, we have to talk about geometry. And for geometry, I'm actually going to do quite a bit more than this. Right now, you you've lost your fear of numbers. Got to see how long this discussion is turning. 27, yeah, we got some more time. So you've lost your fear of numbers. What next? Geometry. Now, on this, I'm actually going to take you through a number of theorems. And again, all of these things have to be practiced. So. That's something about physics and math. You can't just learn it by seeing them. You actually have to get a piece of paper out and do it, do it again. Put your notes to the side and just try to do it from memory and then you'll gain, you'll gain the necessary skills. Yeah, so what do we need in geometry? First of all, we need length, area, and volume. Okay, you're familiar with that. We have a unit of length, okay? If I take a square of a meter on each side, then I have an area. And if I take a cube with a meter on all three sides, then I have a volume, okay? So length, and we're going to use the meter, and the meter will be abbreviated M. And then the area, will have meters squared, and the volume will have meters cubed. Okay. So that's what the, uh, the reality takes place in a volume, and then we have areas and lengths as well. So that's the very outline of geometry, where it's taking place. Now let me go to just some useful facts of geometry. So I have, I'll go ahead and take a triangle. Um, actually, I'm going to take a rectangle. A and B. We've got a rectangle. Right angles right there. And what is its area? area equals A times B. Or I could use, say, capital A equals A times B. 
we're going to write formulas down quite often and you just become accustomed to it to designate things with letters. Okay, A equals A times B. Let's do a triangle. like this, and let's see, I'm going to label angles, and not yet, not the angles. So I've done a triangle, and go ahead and take the rectangle that the triangle fits into, and I can have B for the base and H for the height. And then we can see immediately with using symmetries that the area of that triangle is the area of the rectangle, but we've, we're going to subtract off these shaded areas. So we're subtracting off exactly one half. So what we have for the area of the triangle area A equals one half base times height. Good. Let's keep going. So we get used to drawing things and labeling them. I'm going to do those. I'll, I'll use this right here so I have some room. Now I'm going to do the triangle with the angles. Okay. There's a triangle. I'll go ahead and write alpha, beta, gamma. So we like to use Greek letters for the angles. And you know what? I'm going to turn this into a homework requirement homework, and that is to go online and find a nice page of the Greek letters and print it out for your notebook. So print out, print out the Greek alphabet. Print out the Greek alphabet, upper and lower case. If you're in a fraternity or sorority, you already know a few more. But it's good to print them out and have them. I'll be using them for geometry. And then we have an extra alphabet at our disposal. Okay, so yeah, print them out. Um, they, they go in your notebook, and you know, when you lay out your notes and photograph them, you can, you can show that to me as well. Good, so now we have some angles here. And what about the sum of these angles? So. Let's go ahead and redraw this. And I'm not, I'm not looking for a 90 degree angle right here, so I'll redraw it like so. I've got alpha, beta, gamma. And the sum of those angles is some number universal to these plane triangles. And the way to prove that is to draw two lines here. So these blue lines are parallel and if we extend the sides of the triangle then we can see that we're going to pick up alpha here, beta, gamma, and can we do more? Okay. Yes, because this alpha, I'll need to do these in red, is going to be found here and what else? This alpha is going to be found here. Okay. Some more triangles right up there. And the same thing for the beta is going to be found here. And now that's pretty interesting because you can see that alpha plus beta plus gamma is equal to two right angles. So alpha plus beta plus gamma equals two times right angle equals 180 degrees. 
So the point of doing proofs like this, we're not going to do that many, but we're going to do a few, is just to get accustomed to writing things out like this. You'll notice I'm not even putting any numbers in. It's all constructions. Good. So we have that right angle. I mean, we have two right angles equaling 180 degrees. And the other thing is, when, when the thing is done, of course, you no longer see how I did it. But if you go back to look how I did it, I started with a triangle labeled parallel lines, and then I was able to fill this in and make that discovery. Good, I'm no longer numbering things, am I? That's okay. Let's, uh, ah yes, of course, we want the Pythagorean theorem. So now we do right triangles. And a right triangle has a 90 degree angle. If I name these two alpha and beta, so this is a right triangle. And of course, because there's 90, we have alpha plus beta is 90 degrees, as labeled here. And what about A, B, and C? The Pythagorean theorem, I'll just write Pythagoras, tells us that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Well, actually, I want to do a proof of this as well. This is so useful in the sciences that it's nice to see its proof. See how far we are along here. Yeah, we'll end with the proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Maybe we'll hold off on that. Let's uh, see what else I would have in there now. This will be a good thing to end with. Good, I'm going to do a proof of this Pythagorean theorem. And uh, it'll also give us some opportunity to do a little bit of algebra. Good, the Pythagorean theorem is kind of fun to prove. make use of things we've just put up here. So I begin with, okay, let's title this Pythagorean Theorem. Okay. So here's what I do. I draw a large square just as well as I can. That's reasonably square. And I'm going to mark off a longer and a shorter, so A and B like that. And I'll do the same thing all the way around here. So here I'll have A and B. I'll mark off the long part A, B, and likewise down here, A and B. So now I connect these points and I arrive at a smaller square inside of a larger square. Is this thing really a square? Okay. You can easily show that it is because if I have alpha and beta here, then I have alpha and beta here by the symmetry, and this is 90 degrees because alpha plus beta plus this thing is 180 and alpha plus beta is 90. So the construction shows me that I have a larger square and a smaller square. And I'm going to let um, outside area, so the area of the large square is equal to A plus B, the quantity square. And that is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared inside 
square. So this outside area, I'll call it the outside square and the inside square. The large one and the small one. There's its area. What about the inside square? It's equal to C squared, because I'm going to name this hypotenuse C. Okay. Inside squared equals C squared. Okay. But the outside square which we're returning to now, can also be written as the inside square C squared plus these four shaded areas. Four of these guys here. So C squared plus four times well, what's the area of each of these? One half base times height. So one half a b equals c squared plus two a b. And now there's our proof. The c squared here must be equal to the a squared plus b squared because there's a 2ab and there's a 2ab. Okay, so this exercise is really good because we're actually forced to do a couple of expansions and things like that. And so since you have it in front of you, you don't have to understand it on the first time through. You can follow this construction the expansion of a plus b quantity squared to this, you may have to remind yourself how that works. But we actually have a proof of the Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared, making use of just the facts that we have generated on the other boards here. Good. Now, Conceivably, I could pursue this. I could take this a little bit farther, but this is a good place to stop today. Let me check our time one more. Once more. Yeah, that's plenty of time spent today. So what do we have? We have all of these notes and in, included in your homework assignment. Go ahead and do it right away by by Friday afternoon at 6 if you can find and print out some Greek letters and, and uh, show them to me and slot those into your book. And if you review what we've done, we started out from the need for reasoning just to capture some game and then we saw that the sundial angles were important, um, counting was important, geometry was important, accuracy is important, and we've developed our way through into into some formal geometry. So what we're going to do next time is continue this. I have a couple more little theorems. Um, and then we'll move on. Okay, plenty to do. Plenty to do. We'll move on through our list. Anything else? No, I think that's it for today. So this is the lecture for, second lecture of the semester, so for the Friday. And uh, the next one will be Monday. Okay.